this week I'm going to be talking about empathy, uh, theory of mind, uh, and autism as well, because the, the autism is seen as being related, uh, perhaps in deficits in empathy, theory of mind. So that, that's kind of the scope of uh, this lecture. And really, if we think back to the last lecture which I gave, which was reading faces and bodies, the understanding others is kind of going a little bit further than that in the sense that um, we're, we're interested in really what's going on in, uh, in others' minds, irrespective of what's happening in their, their bodies and so on. And here, one of the key ideas is that of mental states. Uh, so mental states are, are kind of a collective term for a variety of things that could be knowledge, beliefs, feelings, intentions, desires. These are all examples of mental states. <clears throat> and the idea of making an inference um, about a mental state is often referred to as mentalising or it's sometimes called theory of mind. So theory of mind, I guess, is the more uh, traditional word that came about in the late 70s. To some extent, it, th this term mentalising has been picked up, particularly in the social neuroscience literature. And I, I, from my point of view, they're not referring to different things. The, the reason why people have used this term mentalising is that the term theory of mind's been taken by some people to imply a specific mechanism or specific module in the, in the brain that attributes mental states to others. Whereas the term mentalising is seen as being quite theory neutral as to whether or not it's a specific dedicated module or whether it's uh, an emergent property of other kinds of mechanisms in the brain. So, of course, you can still use the theory of the mind in this more general term. Um, but the idea here is that what we do is that when we uh, think about others, that we, we ascribe to them mental states. We think that person knows this, that person believes that, that person intends to do this. We're going beyond superficial things and we're attributing states to others. Okay? So sharing someone's mental state, particularly their feeling, is very much linked uh, to empathy. And one of the things I'll cover is what is the relationship between empathy and theory of mind. And some models kind of imagine that the two as being very uh, similar. They, they're certainly tested rather differently. So empathy is often your kind, your kind of reaction to other people's, whereas theory of mind or mentalising is your kind of inference as to what is their state, the state in their, their head. So uh, th th they are separate, but they might share some underlying uh, uh, mechanisms, but, but hopefully we can pick apart this. And really one of the key ideas that's driven this forward to, from the social neuroscience perspective is this idea of simulation. Um, so I don't know how many people kind of have an urge to yawn uh, looking at this, maybe you did before anyway. Uh, but again, the, people have kind of looked at this as so, uh, almost a kind of a kind of a naive or kind of proxy measure of empathy. Uh, certainly not all species do this, so chimps and other kinds of primates, some of them kind of have this contagious yawning and so on. But the idea behind simulation is really that we understand others by simulating their behaviour in our own heads. We don't have to simulate it on our own body. So uh, an overt simulation might be you see somebody yawning, you yawn yourself. But the idea is that you can do that in your head. You see somebody yawning and you activate your motor circuit for yawning whether or not you yawn. Okay? So it can be done in the head rather than as a, an overt action. Uh, and this very much relates to the idea of simulation that we talked about in terms of reading faces. That you see somebody else's face kind of in a sad expression. You kind of simulate what it would be to generate that kind of sad expression. This makes you feel sad or it understands their sadness. Okay, so facial expressions is one other thing. Okay, um, so there are two kind of variants of this. One is kind of you can simulate in this kind of higher level narrative like sense, kind of more as inferences, or in this kind of more mirroring, kind of contagion, imitative based, perhaps relying on mirror neurons that link together what you see with actions, for instance, and, and what you feel. So th this is simulation theory. Uh, and this is seen as being important, but whether or not it's the only thing that's important is, again, one of the key things that we'll, we'll talk about. What are the advantages of this kind of way of thinking about understanding others? It, it, some people, the attractiveness of this is that you could do away with the special mechanism for inferring mental states, that really all you're doing is that you're coupling together perception uh, and action or you're coupling together what you see and what you kind of feel yourself, that you don't need a special 
uh, mechanism. And this might work for some things. The other kind of attractive uh, thing here is, again, that we, you, you, it's uh, from an evolutionary perspective, you can point to continuity with other species and there is at least one postulated mechanism for, for doing this. It is, to some extent, understood at, uh, you know, down to the level of single neurons. And this is kind of mirror neurons and their kind of associated uh, uh, systems. Against simulation um, is the idea that observable behavior is a poor predictor of internal states. So perhaps we've evolved something that goes beyond this, something that is a bit smarter, a bit more sophisticated that enables us to actually kind of think about other people's minds rather than just uh, a literal kind of readout of, oh, they, they look like this, therefore doing that, something that, that is counterintuitive. So to understand deception, you have to realize that their body's saying one thing and their mind's saying another, uh, for instance. So how, how do you deal with that kind of thing uh, he, here? Um, and we, we'll talk about this, but there is some evidence that the kind of neural system that supports uh, mirroring and so on is rather different from if you put someone on an MRI scan and think about Jane thinks that Sally thinks that X is there. If you give somebody this kind of a puzzle to solve in an MRI scanner, you don't get exactly the same mirror neuron circuit. Well, you don't. You get a, a somewhat different set of reasons, regions. And this points to the idea that actually, although simulation has something for it, there might be something over and beyond that uh, that, that is uh, involved. But again, some people are, are, are still very much kind of arguing simulation is where it's at, and this can explain everything. We can do away with these kind of naive notions of, uh, of this. You know. So this really, is, is, again, is a very divisive issue, and it really kind of cuts the core of uh, a lot of what we'll cover in this lecture series. What are the neural mechanisms supporting social intelligence, for instance, going right back to the, the, the first lecture? This is kind of the, you know, the, the heart of that debate, and it, it, it's still going on. To what extent is it this kind of mechanism or that kind of mechanism, and, and, and so on. <clears throat> right, so really we've got three parts. To begin with, I'll talk about empathy uh, because, uh, in, with regards to simulation theory, and I'll talk about how simulation theory and empathy uh, kind of fit together, but I'll support, talk about evidence that doesn't quite fit with a simple version of simulation. Then I'll talk about theory of mind. So I wonder if um, the simulation and theory is applied for people who share the same context. Otherwise, if you don't have the experience, how can you simulate? Yes, that's right. So the, the, the question here is, is it, uh, do you just simulate for if you have a shared context, for instance? And I think that that's one of the key things that happens is that simulation is kind of seen as being kind of very reflexive and automatic, but it's very contextually dependent. So whether or not you simulate or, or not depends on, on the context. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily depend on your history of kind of having those experiences, although in the motor domain there, there's evidence for that. So. Um, so, for instance, if you see a contortionist move their body in a strange way, you don't necessarily activate your motor circuit. Whereas if you see somebody walking, you will activate your motor circuit just by observing it. So there are these kinds of... It depends on your own history, uh, but it also depends on context in a, a kind of more uh, specific sense. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So most people have a sense of what empathy is, but really when we try and... Uh, formalize it in terms of definitions. You, there are various ways in which people uh, talk about this. And really, one, one of the things I'll introduce is a model of empathy, which does break it down in terms of different facets. But before I do that, these are just different ways in which people uh, think about empathy. Uh, and this isn't a, a kind of exhaustive list. This comes from a list uh, put by Batson, who uh, uh, a social psychologist, who I think had about eight or nine. But this ca captures the essence of it. So the first one is kind of knowing another person's internal state, including their thoughts and feelings. The second one is kind of adopting the posture or matching the neural response of an observed other. So the first one might mean that you know what's going on in somebody else's mind, but the second one is that you actually adopt it yourself. So these are, both of these could potentially be empathy, uh, but they're, they're rather different ways of thinking about it. The other one is kind of having an emotional reaction to someone else's situation, but it need not be uh, the same kind of reaction. So an example here 
is kind of pity or, or sympathy, where you're kind of, you see some, somebody else's plight, but you're not really sharing that plight. You're having an emotional reaction to somebody else's suffering, but you are not necessarily suffering yourself. You've got a social distance rather than a social sharing. And, and um, so the term sympathy was kind of the traditional term for this kind of uh, social distancing, whereas empathy, some people regard as kind of a more sharing. But again, what does that mean, you know, to, to, to this distinction between sympathy and empathy in terms of neural mechanisms? But you, so, you know, having an emotional reaction to someone else's situation, that could be empathy, but it might not be a matched response uh, to others. Um, so again, you know, an example where you don't mirror would be, uh, don't necessarily mirror is anger. So if you see somebody angry, often people have a fear reaction, so they're not mirroring. But if you're a high status person, you mirror back and you get angry if somebody's angry with you. So again, that would be a kind of contextualized uh, sort of thing where you're having an emotional response to others. You're understanding what they're feeling, but you are not necessarily uh, matching what they're feeling, for instance. And the, the second ones are kind of more empathy in terms of um, dispositions or traits. So imagining how I would react in that situation. So for instance, you, somebody comes back to you, uh, you know, one of your housemates and tells you a, a sob story about something that happened at work or whatever, and you try and empathise them by thinking, how would I feel by putting, if this happened to me, and so on. But you could also do the same thing by thinking, how, would it, how does it feel to be them, given you know, that this person is a bit neurotic and so on, whereas I might kind of think, well, if it happened to me, it wouldn't bother me. Whereas actually maybe to empathise, you have to think, what is it to be them? And actually they're a bit sensitive, so they're entitled to react differently. This is kind of more in line with perspective taking or kind of higher thought process. But to some extent, this is empathy as well. Okay? So you've got this rather problematic landscape to begin with, and all of these can be construed as empathy, so how do we drill it down? So again, you've got this um, aspect of focus. Are you putting yourself in someone else's shoes as perspective taking, or are you thinking about yourself, uh, for instance, as social distancing? And this is kind of reflected in um, different ways in which you would measure empathy. So empathy could potentially be measured in terms of bodily responses, so sweating, heart rate, and so on. And th this is perfectly legitimate. You look at somebody else in distress and you monitor your own physiological or biological correlates of distress uh, um, there, and that would be a measure of empathy. But it's a measure of one kind of empathy. It's emotional reactiveness to others. It doesn't necessarily mean that you actually know or can infer accurately what's going on. It means that you are responding to... Uh, something going on in others. Most questionnaire-based me measures are more to do with perspective taking, so uh, what, what's often called trait empathy, whether you are an empathic individual, okay? Uh, and what this often means is whether you kind of go out of your way to think about uh, other people's situations and so on uh, with this. Neural responses are obviously kind of similar to bodily responses, except you're measuring the brain. But you might see somebody in pain, and then you look in, inside the observer's brain and see whether they're activating their pain circuitry. And you could say that is a kind of proxy measure of empathy. But again, this is a rather implicit, indirect measure. Empathic accuracy would be how good are people at reading other people's minds. And this can be done either with facial expressions. So this is... Baron Cohen's reading the mind in the eyes test, and this does correlate with lots of things in the real world. Uh, I always get this. He's playful, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, people differ in this. The other kinds of ways of measuring this is with dyadic exchanges, where you're playing some kind of cooperative game with somebody else, and then you watch back a video and you look at what's uh, then you try and read, oh, this person is frustrated at this point, and then the person codes their own behaviour, so you've actually got uh, a template with which to see how well people are for that. So obviously that's rather complicated. Or you show movies of people interacting where people afterwards report of their own feelings and you look at this. So you have an objective way, or at least uh, an independent way of, of assessing accuracy. And again, you can get different results depending on how you measure this. Uh, so if we take, for instance, the issue of gender differences, um, on questionnaire-based measures, there's 
the gender differences tend to be quite pronounced, that women uh, come across as being more empathic than men. On most of the other measures, the gender differences are slight or certainly a lot lower. That in terms of kind of ability to do this, men perform similarly to women. Women tend to have an advantage throughout, uh, but it's much more pronounced on some measures than others. Okay? And again, this might be how you're measuring it, whether you're thinking about uh, whether a kind of a style of thinking as opposed to an ability, for instance, that would be. Uh, one would think of where this comes from, whether this is kind of, you know, uh, cultured, uh, if you like, a tendency for, uh, for this, or whether it's, uh, you know, a disposition we'll talk about. But I'll have something more to say about gender differences in a bit. Um, so this is kind of looking at uh, what empathy is and how we might measure it. So one idea that, that's emerged in the simulation theory is that mirror neurons are the neural bridge between self and others. So this is a very specific instantiation of uh, a simulation theory. And basically there's a set of papers that argue that, um, that empathy is very much linked to imitation. Okay? Uh, not imitation necessarily just in terms of tool use, but imitation in the sense of seeing facial expressions and so on, this kind of level of imitation. Again, kind of stripping this right back to what mirror neurons do. Mirror neurons seem to respond to, um, not just to actions, but to the intention behind the action. So uh, if we ignore this for now, and if you remember back to a previous lecture in which you see a hand reaching for an object, but the object is obscured, okay? So here the intention is to pick up, but the action is the same. So an action to an object is different from a, uh, the same motor thing. So one has an intention to pick up, the other does not have an intention. So mirror neurons seem to encode at least one type of mental state intentions, whether they encode other types of mental states like beliefs, for instance, you know, is, uh, the, the debate is wide open. Uh, and again here, so uh, what you've got is pliers which work in different ways. So in one case you, you pick up a peanut by squeezing it, and the other case you pick up a peanut by releasing it. So you've got two completely different uh, hand actions here, one that's squeezing, one that's releasing. But you get a set of mirror neurons that res respond to the same uh, kind of action, even the, the, the motor thing's different. So the idea here is that this mirror neuron is responding to the intention to grasp and not to the particular uh, motor action. That would be one kind of claim that uh, people in this field have made. It's more that the animal wants to grasp this and the actual means to the grasping is irrelevant. Okay, so it's not purely motor. They, they claim it goes beyond the motor level and that this is related to empathy. And the kind of evidence that they've done in humans, this is one of a highly cited study, which I think is called From Imitation to Empathy, is an fMRI study of facial expressions. And in the scanner, people are asked to either observe or imitate. Um, the, the, uh, the facial expression. When asked to imitate, you get uh, activity in your kind of classical mirror neuron system, which is your pre-motor cortex into Broca's area uh, and so on. But also what you get is activity in uh, your kind of emotional parts of the brain, such as the amygdala and the insula that are involved in uh, decoding uh, emotions. So the claim that these authors have made is that you've got visual perception You've got your motor mirror neuron system, and then you've got your affective uh, system here. So you've got vision, you've got motor, then you've got affect. Uh, so the motor is the imitation aspect. Other things have looked at individual differences. So you can give uh, people in the scanner questionnaire measures, asking them how empathic are you, uh, you know, and, and there, there are a set of questionnaires, and showing that the extent to which you kind of have this imitative uh, brain activity in the motor system it correlates with your with these kind of uh, real world questionnaires of empathy that, that's been done. Um, what is typically the correlation between how empathic are you and how good are you at empathy? No, in this in this case it's not. It, this is an indirect measure of empathy in this case. This is yeah, how much your brain is responding uh, yeah. to yeah. I mean like with regards to what you were talking about before. Right, yes. Um, 
Yes, so that's yes, so that's a good question. So the question here is how much does this predict how good you actually are in the accuracy? And uh, people have debated this, and it, it, the, the correlation is, uh, goes in the right direction, but it's small. It is small. So this is more a tendency to empathise, and this is an ability. So it, it is a positive correlation. I couldn't give you a number, but um, uh, it, it's not as large as you might think. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. And both of these measures are used? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, exactly. So here the correlation is between a questionnaire-based measure and a neural response. Uh, but others have looked at it in various other ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it is really important to kind of think about it in these different terms. Yeah, and there's a whole kind of social psychology um, literature on imitation. Uh, so this is kind of the, the classic study that everyone starts by cites by Chartrin and Barr. Um, and basically, what you do here is that you you play a game with another participant in which you have to cooperate to. Uh, achieve some kind of a goal um, and what happens is that one of the other participants is actually in on it they're an experimenter and they just kind of subtly imitate uh, the body language of the person they're cooperating with uh, and what you um, find is that at the end of the task people report liking the person that imitates them and feeling that the task was accomplished more smoothly so even something that is not a social uh, judgment. It's just a judgment of the task itself. Uh, you, you get this kind of positive kind of halo around the task when you're imitated. Um, and again, you know, it, it has a more general kind of pro-social effect. So uh, here what you do is you, you play some kind of task and then you give them the participant money and you, you say to them, you can donate some of your participant money to this charity. Uh, you can donate as much or as little of it as you want. If the person was imitated during the task, they donate more to the charity. Okay? So they, it's not just about reciprocal kind of helping the person that's imitated you. You help others, uh, including kind of, you know, in this kind of charitable donation. So being imitated kind of creates a positive thing that means that you will go uh, and help others. It's not just a, a contextual kind of reciprocity between the person who imitated you. It's a bit more of a general uh, effect. Uh, and it also, sorry, um, yeah, it also, yeah, so this is dropping something. It's been done both with charitable donation and here it's just, a, you know, somebody uh, knocks off a pile of books or something and whether or not you're going to help that person uh, depends on whether they imitated you or depends on whether you've just been imitated you know, by another person. Okay, so that so suggests that there is something to the idea of simulation um, and imitation, but, but there's clearly more to it than this. So we've already mentioned empathic accuracy and so on, the actual ability to do this. Um, others have argued, well, actually, you know, may, maybe you can simulate without the motor system. Maybe you can just go straight from seeing uh, facial expressions or seeing things to, to the emotional brain without actually going via the action system. So non-imitative simulation, if you will, non-motor-based simulation. Um, also, simulation is sometimes found and it sometimes isn't. So there's a whole literature about uh, empathy for pain. Um, and this is one of the early studies. And basically what Singer did is she got uh, people, I think that they were all women in the first study, to come in and to bring their partners with them, so their boyfriends. Uh, and what happens is, is that the person in the MRI, MRI scanner would get a mild electric shock or that they would receive um, a cue on the computer screen telling them that their partner was having a mild electric shock. Okay? And what you find is that there are parts of the brain involved in the physical perception of pain, including the um, anterior cingulate and the anterior insula, uh, that are activated both when you receive physical pain and when your partner uh, re receives the shock. Okay? It's not completely the same, so there are some uh, parts of the brain that respond just when you're in shock, but not when your, your partner is. And these tend to be in much more kind of sensory areas involved in early kind of perception of pain, whereas later kind of uh, higher up the hi hierarchy, uh, you get that. So that's all well and good, but what about strangers or what about people who you, you don't really know if you see somebody else in pain? Uh, so this is um, a really a great study by uh, Singer et al. that's a follow-up on this. 
And here you have a group of players, virtual people, uh, who you play a game with. And you play a game in order to uh, win money. Okay? But some of the players play fairly, which means that you both end up taking away uh, money. And some players play unfairly, uh, which means that they effectively exploit you for their own gains. Okay? And this is all done outside of the scanner. Then inside the scanner, one of three things happen. Either you get an electric shock, you're told that the fair player is getting an electric shock, or you're told that the unfair player is getting an electric shock. Okay? And what you find, so here this is activity in the anterior insula, which is involved in bodily perception, but also uh, processes physical pain, is that both men and women, um, so these are the females here, these are the males here, that's your left uh, hemisphere, your right hemisphere, the hemisphere is completely irrelevant, so you get the same response in both. Um, both men and women respond more, have more empathy for pain for the fair player relative to the unfair player, okay? What you find in the males is that really the women carry on having some empathy in this kind of neuro neurophysiological sense for the unfair player in that they still activate their pain uh, centres, whereas the men dampen it down uh, to zero in, in effect. Okay? So again, you've got this similarity that everyone uh, empathises less with the unfair person. The men also report... Um, uh, they also start activating other regions of the brain, including the nucleus accumbens, which is seen as a reward or pleasure centre of the brain, okay? <laughs> when the unfair player gets the electric shock. So here, this is not simulation. You're seeing somebody in pain, and your neural response is pleasure, okay? Uh, so th this is kind of a complete uh, a mismatch between them. And the amount of activity in this pleasure centre is correlated with their desire for revenge on the... Uh, the other person, and you don't get this pattern in the women. Okay, but, but again, these are small samples. You might do with a larger one, and you will find some women who are, uh, have the male pattern, and some males who have the female pattern. Okay, so this is uh, you know it's really interesting, uh, kind of fun study. Any kind of comments or thoughts on this, or where the gender differences are coming from? I, I, I don't know where the gender differences are coming from. Uh, would be my kind of answer uh, to this. I mean, you know, to some extent, I, I, th I think that there probably is a bit of a biological disposition that maybe culture reinforces to some extent. Um, you know, and historically, or over the course of evolution, men would have always gone to war, for instance, more than women, and you have to learn to switch off in order to inflict pain on others. Um, you know, uh, throughout history, more people probably died from war than uh, most from natural causes. You know. But, uh, I don't know. But anyway, there's a whole kind of literature about uh, this. So if we stick with the domain of pain, if someone's deemed to be uh, unfair or bad, then you simulate less in this particular sense. People have also done it with uh, acupuncturists uh, and to some extent doctors. So here, when you see somebody uh, in pain, a doctor doesn't necessarily respond in the, the same kind of simulation. And I think this is important to say, that doesn't necessarily mean that your doctor is not empathic. It means that your doctor has got good control over their simulation mechanisms. And you're going to need to be in order to perform surgery or if you've got somebody screaming with a broken leg in front of you. So it doesn't mean that your doctor is unempathic. It means that one aspect of empathy, this simulation mechanism, either, you know, either they've opted into the medical thing because they, can, they, they have it less, or that they've learned to kind of regulate or control the system. Was that tested like um, during while they, they perform procedures versus at other times? No, it's just uh, observing uh, movies in a scanner. So it's, it's not in a, a naturalistic oh, okay. so, setting. So they've, like, they've essentially tamped down that system like, across the board, not just... Yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, they didn't measure it kind of contextually in that way, yeah. Um, and here, this is in um, other people in which they're, they're showing kind of, uh, you know, like little clips from Holby City where people are having operations or whatever. Uh, but if you tell people that the operation is going to be successful, then they, um, they don't activate their pain system as much as if they're told that the outcome of the operation is not going to be successful. Uh, so it's almost as if, you know, you feel somebody else's pain. If, the, if it's kind of uh, no pain, no gain, you, you kind of somehow... <laughs> Uh, factor this in. Uh, but also, this is kind of the deliberate aspect, whether or not 
one takes the self or other perspective. If you instruct somebody in a scanner, imagine what it's like to be that person in that person's shoes versus you instruct somebody to keep a social distance. This affects how uh, the activity within the pain system is kind of modulated uh, by this, just by instructing or keeping a, a social distancing. Uh, whether or not that's kind of the difference between men and women, th this kind of tendency to, to go into somebody else's uh, body versus, you know, keep a social distance, I don't know. And, and similarly, um, in, in social psychology, Bandora, who's obviously a very uh, eminent uh, social psychologist, has argued that, you know, simulation has a role to play, but it's probably relatively minor. And again, he brings out the evidence that actually humans tend to be very cruel to each other, uh, that we don't like outgroups, we go to war and so on, and that actually we, you know, most of the time we're not simulating, otherwise it would lead to emotional overload is one argument, and the reality is we're not as kind as we might think we are uh, to each other. Okay. Um, so, so one, yeah, so one aspect is empathy and one aspect is the regulation of empathy and, you know, just because you regulate your empathy a lot doesn't make you an unempathic person and this is, you know, uh, the, the kind of issue that you've got to wrestle with. Uh, but also, if you look at imitations, so people imitate each other less if they're, imitate, if they're cooperating with an outgroup or somebody with uh, social s uh, stigma, um, uh, such as you know, facial scars, heavily obese, you don't tend to imitate as much in those situations. So again, you're regulating this kind of simulation system according to context, coming back to your question in terms of who you're interacting with uh, here. Oh, and the, the people have done this with ad groups as well, both racial ad groups, football ad groups, and uh, when somebody else is getting pain, if they're an ad group, you don't share that as much. You don't share in each other's pain if they're an ad group. <clears throat> so the Setti's model of empathy is a nice model in that it brings together, to some extent, these different conflicting uh, views of what empathy is and the kinds of mechanisms that might be part of them. So his model of empathy has three different types of component. One is shared representations between self and other based on perception, action, coupling. So this is your classic kind of uh, simulation mirror-based system. He doesn't say it's all to do with action-based uh, mirror neurons. He, he says there could be other kinds of representation, but essentially this is simulation, number one. But then he introduces to this two other ideas one is that, um, that you need a mechanism for keeping the self and other as distinct and understanding your own feelings as being separate from other people. So to avo avoid this kind of emotional overload, perhaps based on physical perspective taking or whatever. He attributes this to this region of the brain called the right TPJ, right temporal parietal junction. And you will see this a lot in the theory of mind literature. So. Um, uh, Rebecca Sachs at MIT says that this is the, the core region for theory of mind, okay? I'll come to that debate. But either way, it suggests that there's something over and beyond uh, simulation here. Um, it, this tends to be activated, for instance, uh, when you're thinking about someone else's actions more than your own actions, and it tends to be activated when you're thinking about someone else's beliefs more than your own beliefs. Uh, for instance, so it seems to kind of track this self-other distinction. Um, yeah. And then the third one is kind of more mental flexibility, which they kind of link more with executive functions and the, the frontal lobes. And this is kind of your deliberate ability to shift perspectives or to kind of choose to, to distance or regulate. So again, there's some evidence suggesting that if you have relatively uh, poor frontal lobe function on certain kind of tests of flexibility and so on, you are, you're the kind of person who goes to pieces when you see somebody in the street with a broken leg. Whereas if you have good kind of uh, frontal lobe executive functions, you are able to kind of deal with that situation in a kind of a cold uh, kind of way. So this is, uh, these two mechanisms are kind of involved in deliberate perspective taking and, uh, and so on. So. Um, where is empathic accuracy isn't clear. It's probably a mixture of each of these ones. But this is perhaps um, more related to kind of what you're getting in questionnaire-based measures. This is what you're getting in a lot of uh, when you're measuring bodily responses and brain responses. Does that mean that psychopaths have got um, more, more, more yeah. empathy than people with executive function? Well, that, that's, that's exactly one, um, one thought. So this is... 
it's a really interesting literature, and I, I, I don't know whether I set an essay on it, but it's something that we can talk about, because I will talk about psychopaths. But uh, both psychopathy and uh, autism are both seen as being linked to poor empathy, but they're clearly very different things, you know. So most autistic people aren't cruel. They don't go out the way to kind of inflict harm and so on. Um, there, there is some evidence, for instance, that, uh, that bullies in schools have higher social intelligence and, and, and so on, that they're, they're often quite good on certain tests. But yes, that's right. The one theory is that they're good at regulating this. So, um, so one idea is that autism is perhaps more at this level here, of the kind of the shared uh, gut instincts, although that's controversial, and that here, this is kind of more psychopathy. It's kind of getting... Uh, uh, yeah, getting pleasure out of pain and so on. But you get pleasure out of pain if it serves your own needs or whatever, you know, uh, to do that if you're exacting revenge on, you know, whoever, <laughs> this, this sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, that's a really interesting question. So here I, I've kind of touched on theory of mind because a, a lot of um, the literature on empathy um, kind of connects with it. So here the connection to theory of mind is these kind of higher order or kind of regulatory mechanisms where you're treating others as distinct from yourself. Okay. <clears throat> um, so simulation theory doesn't really make a strong distinction between the mechanisms of empathy and mentalizing the theory of mind, but other theories do. Um, again, you, you tend to have rather different tasks for measuring empathy and theory of mind. So empathy tends to be measured in terms of a response to a particular event, e.g. seeing someone in pain. You ask somebody how bad do you feel, you record their sweat, sweat and you see what's happening in the brain. That's the kind of way in which empathy is kind of normally used. Theory of mind tests normally um, involve reasoning about mental states. So a typical theory of mind test is that you give somebody a story and you say, you know, Sally goes here, John does that, what does Sally think? Okay, and then you have to kind of piece it together, what, what's uh, gone on here. So it's kind of a more narrative-like uh, thing. It may involve vision, it may involve uh, words or whatever, but, but the idea is it's kind of integrating across time. Yeah. If morality is uh, when you think about moral thought, it gets in, it's related to theory of mind. Morality? Yeah. Uh, uh, most, yeah, so that's uh, really interesting as well. So there's a lecture on that. So the, the current theory is about morality is that, it, again, it's both of these in the same way as empathy is. Uh, but the idea here is that you can either, um, if you're making a, a kind of moral judgment, you can either go on your gut instinct, which is that, or you can kind of reason your way through right and wrong, which is that. Uh, and the idea is that whenever you're making this judgment, you're, you're weighing up different lines of evidence. Uh, and uh, some people debate that your gut instinct is what carries your moral judgment. And other people say it's your inferential reasoning that carries your moral judgment. But we will cover that in another lecture. But the idea is it, as we, it's both. <laughs> you know, uh, and it's a question of how the two come together. Um, OK, so this is a, a fun kind of one that's kind of linked to theory of mind. Uh, uh, it's not in sound. Okay, so, so this is, 
most people are going through a lot of kind of mentalizing with this. He thinks this, she thinks, oh no, he, yeah, well, he and she is kind of a type of mentalizer, but you know, this person's scared, this one's angry, and so you're attributing mental states uh, to this, okay? I, whether that's empathy, I don't know, but, but again, here, you're going way beyond the information given these aren't bodies or faces. It's, it's completely uh, abstract. Uh, so this is kind of um, anthropomorphism here, I and mean, this is uh, a different scenario. There was obviously not a mother and child in that one there. But the idea is that we, we are, this is what we as humans do. We kind of project mental states everywhere into each other. We kind of, uh, it's not just about empathy, we're really kind of trying to put ideas in each other's head. That person's angry, this person is doing this, and so on. So there's a whole kind of theory of God based on this as well, that what God is, you're kind of attributing mental states into non-physical beings, that God's angry, God wants you to do this, and, uh, and so on. So there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, interesting links there, that this is kind of theory of mind projected out into uh, uh, other kinds of beings, uh, in, in, in effect. Um, Right, yes, so again, so here, for instance, when you uh, look at uh, videos like this, th there's a set of brain regions that, that you activate that's also involved if you're given verbal narratives about this. And these are kind of your theory of mind network. It includes regions such as the right temporal junction that uh, De Setti has in his model of empathy, looking at keeping self and other separate. If you show these videos to people with autism, for instance, they... Um, they don't come out with these kind of mentalizing adjectives about that in the same way, and they show far less activity in uh, the, the, the theory of mind network to, to viewing these simple stimuli. The control stimuli would just be having shapes moving around randomly rather than interacting, so you've got an equivalent level of visual complexity, but you don't, uh, you don't come up with the same kind of narrative in your head with it. So these are the, the classic, two classic kind of developmental studies of theory of mind that most of you uh, are, are probably familiar with from uh, your psychology lectures, but uh, I'll show you this movie. It's uh, a sweet little girl and a slightly creepy experiment. No, Elizabeth. What do you think's inside this box? Pilates. Have a look inside. Can't take the lid off. Oh, well, let me have a go, shall I? You ready? Say go. Go. What's in there? What's that? Headstones. Oh, right. Should we put them back in the box? Yeah. What, what are they for? Should we put the lid on? Now, can you remember what's inside the box? Headstones. And what did you think was in the box? Headstones. Did you? Now, I'm going to show this box to Jay in a minute. What will Jay think is in the box? Headstones. I think. Good. After you... Okay, so this is... Uh... Uh, a, a classic kind of a false belief. So, so the false belief is the idea that other people are capable of um, entertaining ideas that differ from your own uh, ideas and differ from the current state of reality in that. So we would say that this person here doesn't, isn't able to, to understand that others uh, have mental states that differ from her own and also from uh, physical reality. And this supposedly comes in line age uh, three to four, but this is one of the ideas that we'll re re refer to in the, the seminar next week, whether in fact something is kicking in earlier than that. Um, so th this is kind of one of your classic uh, tests of theory of mind. So again, it's very different from the empathy studies in which you see somebody in pain and so on. You're having to go through a deliberate inference as to what does that person think, what will they say, what will they do. Uh, with that, okay. Um, and the other um, classic example is the um, the object, uh, the, the kind of moving the object. I don't know what the name of this paradigm is. It's the Sally Ann task is her most right now. She is. This is Sally, and this is Anne. All right. Now, Sally comes in with her marble. Sally puts her marble into the basket and goes out. Anne comes and gets the marble and she puts the marble in the box. 
Here comes Sally. Here comes Sally. Now, where will Sally look for the marble? for her. Hooray! But for another child, Connor, the outcome is somewhat different. Sally comes in to find her marble. Where will Sally look for her marble? And where was the marble in the beginning? That's it? Good. Should we look for the marble now? Where, where, where did you say the marble is? Have a look. It. Okay, so this is the kind of evidence that uh, came around in the, the 1980s, and the idea here is that Connor has developed a theory of mind, and Elizabeth has not yet. Okay, um, so this is the ability to kind of infer mental states, and the idea is uh, that the false belief test is a good way of inferring mental states because it has to be mental states. You have to dissociate it from reality. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why Elizabeth might have got it wrong in the first case, so she seemed to kind of be helping Sally by saying, here it is, uh, you know, but, but again, you know, people have looked into various control conditions, so that might apply in this example, but in general it doesn't. If you also ask, you can ask questions such as where will she look, or also where does she think it is, and it doesn't really matter whether you focus on the, the behaviour or the, the mental state in terms of the question, you tend to get the, the same kinds of pattern uh, here. But again, there's a whole literature on this, so some people would say, well, actually, Elizabeth does know where to look, but she can't inhibit her own kind of wanting to, to go to the correct place. That, that's another uh, theory, and we'll explore this a bit next week. But, yeah. Was there a reason that they have the Sally doll looking at the tin? Uh, instead, of look, instead of being on... I mean, the Sally doll was actually looking at the tin. Could that have right. influenced the Oh, I see. Thought? Like, it's a bit strange that they didn't have it not looking at Yeah. Her. I, I, I don't know if that was on purpose. No, I, I, don't, I, I don't quite know how this has kind of been yeah, done right, in the okay. literature. Obviously, this okay. is a bit of a demonstration here. Yeah. Um, it, it's one of these things that's kind of been done to death a little bit. I suspect it must have been done with real kids at some point or actors. And, but, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, supposedly, it doesn't matter would be the, the correct answer. But yeah, you're, you're right. There's so many things that you would need to control for in these kinds of tests. Yeah. Uh, but, but here, the, the idea is that you give the, inc the correct answer is, um, you know, it conflicts with reality, okay? So what we'll do before I go into kind of talking about what happens in the brain when you're doing this and looking at autism, we'll have a break uh, for 10 minutes. So it's 11.52 now. Okay, guys, we can start up again. I think most of you are back. So, yeah, so I've kind of introduced the idea of theory of mind and the, the kinds of tests that people have uh, used to look at it, particularly the, the false belief test, although that's not the only one. Um, and then the other kind of main issue that, that stemmed from this, really, is, is theory of mind domain specific? Now, what they mean by this is, in effect, that there is uh, a, a set of processes in the brain, you can call it a module if you want, that is, um, deals only to infer mental states, whether that is its function, that's what it's evolved, and that's what this brain circuit does. It, it serves one particular function on one particular kind of uh, things, i.e. mental states. Um, so what kind of evidence would people uh, put forward for this? Well, there's been two kinds of evidence. One is looking at the neural circuits that respond to theory of mind and say, are there sets of brain regions that you can identify that respond to, to thinking about mental states that don't respond to thinking about other kinds of things or other types of cognitive processing? The other way of looking at it is, can theory of mind be impaired leaving other aspects of cognition, including other aspects of social cognition, relatively intact. 
And most of the evidence here has come from the developmental condition of autism, although there is a contribution to be made from uh, looking at adults with brain damage to, to selective parts of the brain here. Before we look at that, nobody is denying that to pass these kinds of theory of mind tests, you, you need some domain general mechanisms. So you need to have a reasonable uh, understanding of language. You need to have reasonably good executive functions for inhibiting incorrect responses that might seem uh, salient, uh, reasoning, and so on. So nobody denies that other things are important. The question is whether that is the, the sole answer, that the ability to do this is just, in effect, the sum of all these parts, or whether there is some other mechanism on top of this that enables you to make the inference that Sally thinks it's somewhere that it isn't really. Okay? Uh, that, that's the, 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 the key thing here. And a lot of this comes down to the question of well, what is the appropriate kind of control condition for, for these kinds of tasks. Uh, and that's something that you can perhaps think about uh, yourself. So if we look at the, uh, the brain uh, imaging evidence, um, Frith and Frith did a review of all the studies. I mean, it's 10 years to date uh, now, but, but uh, recent results has looked at this. So I've used theory of mind type tests. So this includes, for instance, the uh, anthropomorphic triangles chasing each other. It includes kind of classic uh, theory of mind tests involving false belief. What does John think? Where, does, where will Sally look? These kinds of uh, mental state inferences. And they, they reported three different brain regions that, they, that seem to be consistently activated uh, in these kinds of tasks. So one is the um, anterior temporal lobe. Um, to some extent, this, although they put this as a candidate brain region, it's fallen off the, uh, the radar in terms of a, a theory of mind mechanism. So it responds to lots of other different things. It seems to be involved in semantic memory, so linking together narratives and stories and so on. If you damage this region, you have poor kind of conceptual knowledge, but, but typically broadly, not, um, not just in the social uh, domain. So it seems to be involved in kind of language, reasoning, conceptual knowledge, but it doesn't seem to be involved in that. So the reason why it's activated in all these tasks doesn't imply that it's a theory of mind module. If you um, damage this region, yeah, you do fail theory of mind tests, but you also fail the control conditions because your, your language and conceptual knowledge is impaired as well. So it's not specific uh, to that, but, it, but it's important uh, for theory of mind would be one way of thinking about it. Up until the last, um, I don't know, five to ten years, this was the region that most people were interested in as being a, a kind of theory of mind hotspot. And it's the, the medial prefrontal cortex. So here, if you imagine your two hemispheres and you imagine the kind of the gap between your two hemispheres, if you part the, the bit at the front, it's the bit inside there. So again, it, it's not quite your orbitofrontal cortex, which is Damasio's kind of... Um, uh, the region involved in uh, you know, somatic markers and, and, and so on. It, it's this region here um, that is kind of in the middle there. Um, so this is a review by Amodio and Frith where they, they argue that this part of the brain is particularly activated in what they call thinking about thinking, um, uh, whereas other, other, other things are involved, um, other parts of the medial prefrontal cortex are involved in rather different functions. So, for instance, it responds more when you're thinking about mental states than physical states. So a physical state might be hunger or tiredness, where you're making an attribution to others, uh, for instance. So it, it seems to be involved more in, in that, in terms of this is brain activity left and right. Now, it could just be that mental states are harder to process, so you need to activate this region more, right? So you have to kind of take these results you know, with, with a pinch of salt. You've got to understand the methods behind them. It doesn't prove that it's crucial only to mental states. But this is what they do. Uh, th this is also kind of curious in that it responds most when thinking of the self or thinking of others in relationship to the self. Um, so it's rather different from the other region I'll talk about, which seems to respond more when thinking about others than the self. This region seems to respond more to self-thought than other thought. It also responds to people who are, if thinking about your mother, for instance, may activate this region. So people who are close to you uh, or, or boyfriends, girlfriends would, would tend to do this. 
initial evidence, so uh, Chris Bird in, in psychology actually had a, a, a patient with a very rare kind of selective lesion here and showed that this person could pass all the theory of mind tests, the, the kind of classic theory of mind tests, despite having a lesion exactly in the, the kind of region of the Frith and Frith kind of FRI meta-analysis, which kind of suggested, well, although this region's important, it might not be critical. Subsequent to that, in the last two years, there have been um, group studies of patients with damage to this region, which suggest that they are impaired on a theory of mind tests, uh, but not necessarily the control tests, and not necessarily on other tests of executive function involving inhibition uh, and kind of control of behaviour. So the jaw is still out on this. It, it does seem to be important for theory of mind, but whether it's I, I really specific for theory of mind isn't clear. Other people have said, well, it, it's obviously relevant for theory of mind, but the, its function is kind of um, creating uh, or imagining kind of social events. So imagining uh, integrating different sorts of information from the social world and the non-social world. So kind of these narrative thematic uh, schema type uh, that this is how people tend to, to behave it, it sounds very woolly but that is the way that these theories are kind of articulated thinking about social events so it's not a specific theory of mind but it would tap that um, what I mean by that it's not just involved in saying that person has this mental state or that mental state it's involved more broadly in other aspects of social cognition so this is a part of the brain that we will come back to it, it is important to, in theory of mind it's not one of your classic mirror neuron regions, okay? This isn't, this isn't, this isn't, but people kind of have debated that as well. So this is the third region that they identified, both on the left and the right in their review. So in brain imaging, typically you, you get more symmetrical activity because if you activate one side, the activation feeds the other. So symmetrical activation is normal. Uh, and this is kind of the, the new kind of where it's at brain region for theory of mind. So it used to be here, now it's here in the sense where... Uh, but but uh, again, some people are kind of vociferally ar arguing that this is a do domain-specific uh, region for attributing mental states. So uh, the person there to cite would be Rebecca Sachs at MIT uh, who, who's argued this. So this responds when thinking about others' mental states more than their own states. So this seems to respond more to the other than the self. Uh, the medial PFC seems to have the opposite profile. This is kind of interesting. So it responds more to false beliefs than to false photographs or false maps. So uh, a false photograph would be that you take um, a photograph of an apple on a tree and then the apple falls off. Uh, for instance, so the photograph is not a true depiction of uh, current reality. So you've got this kind of counterfactual uh, 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 basis. But, but again, it, it, thinking about false photographs isn't, uh, doesn't activate the region in the same way as false beliefs. And autistic people can understand false photographs, understanding that actually it was on the tree and it is now, and that this photograph isn't a representation of the true state of the, the world in the way that they struggle with beliefs. Okay. Um, as with the, the, um, the medial PFC, it responds more to, uh, it responds to true beliefs as well as false ones, but not necessarily other states as, uh, such as tiredness or hunger. It doesn't necessarily respond to them. So it's not just about thinking about others. It seems to be thinking about others' minds, uh, you know, uh, in particular. And perhaps uh, importantly is that it's been shown that if you, this is in uh, patients with uh, strokes and so not autism, <coughs> But lesions in this region can lead to impairments on theory of mind tests, your kind of object uh, place where, where you move it from place A to place B. Again, this isn't, um, it, it's, it's, so this is Rebecca Sachs's image. She, so other people claim, ah, but th this uh, region is involved in perceiving bodies and so on. Rebecca Sachs says, no, it isn't. It's next to the part of the region in perceiving bodies. So the SDS is uh, the region that I talked about last week that's involved in uh, recognising where people are looking and recognising body motion from point light walkers uh, and so on. So uh, people say, oh, oh, this could be kind of related to the mirror system. Rebecca says, no, it's next to a part of the, the brain that seems to be inputting to the mirror system, but it's not uh, the, the, the same one. Um, 
Also, uh, again, Rebecca Sachs has done some studies of blind individuals where, again, uh, you don't have access to facial expressions, imitations, so on. The task there, obviously, narrative theory of minds in which you're given uh, a story and you ask what people believe, and you get the same network. So this network isn't put in, these are congenitally blind, so it's not put in by the visual system. It seems to have a life that is independent of uh, our visual world, in effect. Whereas simulation theory, although it's not strictly tied to vision, it, it kind of, uh, you know, it's very visually dominant in, in terms of what they Um, I don't know. I, I, I suspect it might have been done, but, uh, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, so, is there a domain specific theory of mind? It, it's not clear at, at the moment, but there certainly are some regions that seem to be um, very strongly involved in these kinds of tasks, whether it's, whether it's their only function is, is uh, really not uh, at all clear. But, uh, um. So let's turn to autism now. So most people have an idea what autism is. So this is just uh, an anecdote. He wandered about smiling, making stereotype movements with his fingers, crossing them about in the air. He shook his head from side to side, whispering or humming the same three-note tune. He spun with great pleasure anything he could seize upon spin. When taken into a room, he completely disregarded the people and instantly went for the objects, preferably those that could be spun. He angrily shoved away the hand that was in his way or the foot that stopped on, stepped on one of his blocks. So this is a description of Donald H. Five, who uh, was in, in the kind of the original report of autism in 1943. It was also independently reported by Asperger um, uh, as well, for which a variety of autism is named. So Asperger's syndrome, is um, typically regarded as high-functioning autism, so normal IQ, uh, uh, but impaired social ability. The actual technical definition of uh, Asperger's though, is, uh, has a more developmental thing. There, you, there was no initial delay in language that they uh, seem to be cognitively normal in terms of their linguistic and other development then lagged behind. So it's used in these two different contexts, one to imply kind of an unexpected, is, well, both definitions imply an unexpected level of social impairment, but one is tagged to developmental trajectory and the other way in which it's used is tagged to kind of current performance, if that makes any sense. Um, so, so it's worth bearing in mind that the terms are used in rather ambiguous ways. So there's actually a new uh, DSM-5 now, characteristic of autism, but which are essentially uh, keep, keep in place the, the, the social aspect uh, of it. It's introduced other things as well. But the, the key things here is markedly abnormal development or impairment in social interactions and communication. So the communication uh, isn't seen as being separate. The, you don't communicate because you don't understand other people's. Uh, you don't understand other people basically. Uh, so uh, the social world kind of is important for learning language and so because um, you, commun you, you talk to others communicate ideas and so on. And the second one here is the restricted repertoire of interests and activities. Um, again, so it's a developmental condition noted early in life, uh, early and persisting throughout life, and it's regarded as a spectrum, which means that the severity is uh, different. So a lot of people with autism also have very low IQ. Um, they're not all kind of, you know, have these super abilities and so on. Only about 10% of people with autism have uh, very good kind of abilities and kind of maths or this sort of thing. So it's a little more than you might expect, uh, but, but it's certainly not the case that m most people with autism are brilliant at calendars or maths or this kind of thing. Okay, I've already been through this. Um, so what are the explanations of autism? And really what I mean here are the explanations of the social impairments in autism, uh, reading between the lines. So one idea um, coming from uh, Simon Baron Cohen and Uta Frith was the idea of mind blindness, which is in effect that they have a selective theory of mind deficit. Um, so this is the smartest test that we've already uh, seen here. Uh, so autistic children fail the, uh, the Sally-Ann task uh, and the smartest task. Um, 
but they, they pass other, other tests. So most children by the age of four or five can pass these uh, tests. Uh, autistic children fail them. In the original studies, they also had mental age controls who were children with Down syndrome who also passed them more than the children with uh, autism in that. So they have uh, you know, looked at other photographs. They can also reason about false photographs, um, which don't involve mental states, but they do involve uh, kind of things that differ from current reality. They're poor at deception with a bias towards thinking that everyone's truthful. So again, this is the idea that other people think what you think, a kind of more egocentric uh, kind of pattern of thinking. Uh, again, they, they, in terms of their language, they tend to avoid kind of words denoting beliefs and ideas, but they do use words involving desires and emotions. And, and I think one of the, the things that hasn't really been done in this literature, which might be kind of a future direction, is to stop using the term like mental states and think about different ones. So thinking about beliefs might be different from thinking about feelings and, and so on. And this is kind of partly the way that, that it, it's kind of fractionating. So thinking about somebody's feelings might be different from thinking about whether they know the, the location of an object in a box. But uh, I, I haven't seen a well-articulated theory along those lines, but uh, you can see how the, the direction of the field is moving. Um, so this is good evidence that, uh, that, that children with autism fail on theory of mind. The question is whether that actually proves that theory of mind is a separate specialised mechanism or whether there are some other kinds of things going on. That, that's the real crux of it, but they, they do fare poorly on those tasks. And that, that's kind of a fact. How you explain the fact is another matter. So again, other people have looked at whether or not it's a problem in executive dysfunction, so kind of frontal lobe uh, problems in inhibiting competing solutions. But not all people with autism show executive dysfunction. Um, and those who do show uh, problems in executive function, it's often on very open-ended tasks. So typically on a lot of tasks you have to kind of almost read between the lines of the instructions and think what is the experiment wants you to do. Whereas on open-ended tasks you kind of make up your own rules and people with autism tend to fail executive function tasks in which the rules are quite open-ended. Uh, whereas if the rules are very constrained, then they, they tend to pass them. So uh, there's a whole set of studies on executive function and autism here. So they are bad at them. The reasons they're bad at them is kind of open for uh, negotiation. It's not necessarily the case that they're, they're linked to that. Um, they, they do seem to use that. So this is one of your classic kind of theory of mind regions of the brain. They do seem to use this. Uh, region of the brain differently when they're doing kind of standard executive function tests. So whether or not uh, this region of the brain isn't functioning in quite the same way or whatever, we don't know. So there are kind of two sets of uh, competing types of explanation um, to, to the mind blindness. One is to kind of dismiss it and say, yeah, they're, they're bad at these tests, but there are other reasons why. And let's say, well, they're bad at mind blindness, but actually there's a wider profile or a wider kind of set pattern. So Uta Frith has proposed her own idea along weak central coherence, and Simon Baron Cohen has his own idea along empathising and systemising. But both of these people say that they still have theory of mind deficits, but they place a theory of mind deficit within a wider context of uh, abilities and disabilities, if you will. So Uta Frith's idea is that um, the people with autism have a bias towards processing local information and not global information. And the kind of evidence from this kind of comes from the non-social tasks, such as these, in which you have to find the hidden object. So I've done this for the last three or four years, so I can show you that this one is here, uh, right? So you haven't got to use the whole. This one takes me a while. Wh uh, no, this is the hard one. This one takes me a while to find, but it's kind of, where has it gone? It's there, that's it. Yeah. Yep. This one here, you have to kind of, you use an internal line and then you go up, then you go across, then you zoom into it. So you can see I don't have all oh, oh, maybe I do, actually, no, because I'm good at this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're, they're better at this, again, relative to IQ matched uh, controls and so on. And so, um, so again, this suggests that there's a processing style in autism that might kind of encompass the, the social world. 
but, but it, you know, uh, but it goes beyond that. The, there are kind of issues with this as well. So although this is inherently a non-social task, it does differ cross-culturally quite a bit. And what you find is um, that uh, that what, what are called uh, interdependent cultures, so collectivist cultures, show a global processing bias. Whereas um, it, those who come from uh, more westernized independent cultures show a local bias. So even on tests of visual perception, your kind of your social world affects how you see these different uh, shapes. So it might be, in fact, that although the the problems extend beyond the social world into kind of tests of visual perception, it, 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 the, you know, the way we see things is at least partly determined by kind of culture and uh, social identity. And this is something we will come back to. So again, that, that's kind of um, uh, something that, that's worth considering. So the extreme male brain, or the kind of empathising, systemising idea, is kind of Simon Baron Cohen's new kind of theory of autism and uh, individual differences more broadly. Um, he, again, he doesn't dismiss the notion of mind blindness, uh, deficit in theory of mind, but he encompasses it within a wider framework, would be the right way of thinking about this. Uh, so to try and encompass the cognitive strength. So what he suggests is that you can have, in effect, different kind of cognitive processing styles. One that is biased towards empathising, which includes empathy, it includes theory of mind, uh, and so on. Uh, and or you can be uh, systemizing. So systemizing is uh, understanding lawful rule-based systems. So here, sensory systemizing, tapping surfaces, uh, insisting on the same foods every day, motoric systemizing, learning knitting patterns or tennis technique, collecting systemizing, numerical systemizing, and so on. So what he argues, um, in effect, is that everybody can be placed on a, a spectrum of empathizing and systemizing. He brings in gender differences to return to an early part of the lecture and says that females are kind of more biased towards the empathizing than the systemizing, whereas males are more biased towards the systemizing than the empathizing. And in autism, um, you've effectively got an extreme male brain in which you're hyper biased towards systemizing and under biased towards empathizing. Okay. Um, what is the evidence for this? Well, he's developed questionnaires looking at kind of empathizing and systemizing and showing that, um, uh, that, yeah, that females do seem to show this bias, males show this, uh, and people with autism that. It's all well and good, but again, questionnaires are just one way of measuring empathy. You know, other people have looked at kind of simulation-based uh, accounts, and the, 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 it muddies the, the picture when you look at other kinds of evidence a little bit. Uh, certainly the gender differences aren't as strong for other kinds of measures than the ones that he's used. Uh, certainly it is the case that autism is more common in men than uh, women, and the question is why is that? Uh, his account offers uh, a simple explanation, is that men are more likely to have a male-type brain than women. Uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, some women do have a male-type brain, some men have a female-type brain, it's just a law of averages, yeah? So it's not a, a clear cut uh, division, it's just a style of uh, thinking. He's also tried to link this to uh, testosterone and so on. So he's, um, he's taken, for instance, um, prenatal testosterone from women who've had amniocentesis and then followed it up in children and shown that high levels of testosterone in the womb are linked to poor performance on his reading the mind and the eyes test, the, the one I started the lecture with. Uh, so, so this isn't autism specifically, but it's looking at uh, male, uh, well, typically male hormones in, in, the, in utero and linking it to uh, other kinds of behaviour which he links with theory of mind. So there is some intriguing evidence here, okay? Yeah. Uh, what about the brain structure? The brain structure, um, yes, yes, that's right. The, the problem with the, the brain structure in autism is that there's lots and lots of brain region differences. Uh, so you can almost, uh, in your theory, you don't have very circumscribed differences. And again, does that support or go against the, the theory of mind deficit? Well, not necessarily, because they do have other problems as well. But, but uh, yeah, I, I'll come back to that. It's a really good question, yeah. So the evidence, as I said, is uh, as follows. 
it also links with, to some extent, with the broken mirror theory. So there are sex differences in the mirror system measured with both structural fMRI and EEG uh, link, linked uh, to that, uh, which, which tend to favour females over males. Okay, so people have tried to link his ideas with the, the kind of simulation theory. Um, Baron Cohen himself hasn't, is not kind of fully signed up to the simulation theory. He talks about cognitive empathy and uh, affective empathy, whereas cognitive empathy for him is theory of mind and affective empathy is, is, is simulation, but he's still holding out onto the idea of um, uh, a kind of a dedicated theory of mind mechanism. In, 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 yeah. is, there no, is there not a tendency for the psychological literature to report sex differences? rather than when we actually score very similar, there's like a bias in the publication and also, I, I just don't really want this. <laughs> there, there's just a significant difference can be fine because there are, you know, extreme cases, but generally we are quite similar. Absol yes, absolutely, yes, that's right, yes, it's, it's yeah, I mean the different, well, the difference of the there, it's a question of how much you emphasise the differences over the similarities. I, I think is the way I think, but you're right. The similarities probably account. For, there's far more overlap than there are extreme cases at either side. So I think you're right in, in, in saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I guess there's yeah. So there's a bit of uh, a research agenda there in terms of what what people are, uh, are focusing on. And of course, if there are differences, it's completely neutral as to where the differences are coming from as well. To what extent it's biology or or culture. I mean, here obviously this is kind of trying to eliminate cultural influences. How can it eliminate? Well, it doesn't it eliminate it. Yes, absolutely, that's right. But if you're looking at pre, um, in utero testosterone levels, yeah. things like that, you know, it's kind of... But yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah, culture affects the brain as well. Here, yeah, here you're not eliminating it at all. This could be as much cultural as anything else, yeah. So the last one is kind of the, the new kid on the block, and this is broken mirror theory, really, which is um, effectively saying, actually, all the deficits in autism are, are related to, uh, um, uh, to, well, yeah, to, to simulation or, or theory of mind. Again, the, what these people haven't done is that they haven't given a convincing account of how simulation theory can do false beliefs, uh, because false belief is just kind of entertaining the fact that somebody has ideas different from you, and it's not clear how simulation just does that. But anyway, there is evidence for, for, for this broken mirror theory. So the, the essence of it is that the social difficulties uh, in autism are a consequence of mirror system dysfunction. So again, you ask where are the, 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 uh, the brain differences, uh, structural brain differences in people with autism, and the answer is that they're in lots and lots of places. But in this particular study, they correlated the... Um, the d degree of symptoms uh, severity uh, did correlate with a, a region involved in the mirror system, so Broca's area, kind of into the premotor area. So although there were lots of differences there, not all the differences correlated with the, the degree of social impairment, but this was one of the, the, the few results that came out in this study. So, so that's been quite influential. This is kind of repeating the, the study I mentioned before in which you do FRI, in which you ask, show people facial expressions and you imitate them, and show that you get less activity in kind of mirror regions when you're asked to imitate facial expressions if you're autistic relative to uh, appropriately matched controls, typically developing controls. Um, and th this is done, um, well, some is done in kind of young, older children or... Uh, uh, or adult people with uh, autism, most of the neuroscience stuff. So you, you don't get much kind of neuroscience in four or five year olds and so on, which is, uh, th but there are some studies out there, not much. <coughs> right, so what I'll get you to do is just, um, I'll, I'll just introduce you the study that I circulate to get you to kind of think about um, the, this general kind of area. But one of the um, the, the studies that have been done has looked at this thing called mu suppression. So mu is something that you measure with EEG, and basically it's a set of rhythms, uh, electrical rhythms in the brain between 8 and 13 hertz that kind of oscillate or fire in, in rhythm. But the key thing about uh, the mu system is that if I move my hand, okay, my mu system kind of goes down. So when I'm doing nothing, the mu system is very active, 
it's the, as if your motor cortex kind of circulates, or oscillates at a certain frequency. When I move my hands, the mu system gets suppressed, okay? But the, the key thing is that if I watch somebody else performing the same mu movement, the mu system goes down. So it's, it's, it seems to act in the same way as mirror systems do, but it's not measuring single neurons, it's just measuring a particular rhythm, electrical rhythm in the brain. But it shows this property of, um, of doing the same thing whether you are the person doing the action or somebody else is doing it. So this is the, uh, how it's been used. And what they did in Oberman et al. is that they looked at uh, mu suppression when, uh, when people are moving their hands or when they're seeing somebody else moving their hands, as in here, and showing that control subjects show suppression, it goes down, whereas children with autism don't suppress. They don't show this kind of mirroring reaction to a simple hand. What I'm going to get you to do is just think about studying what were the control conditions for those who've read it uh, and the control subjects. How does this kind of broken mirror account in general sit aside kind of other, other accounts? Is it convincing? What, what are the problems for it? Uh, and then we'll just kind of invite some comments. So everybody should have a comment or a question, and I will select some. Thanks. So the criticism of broken mirror theory is that people have looked at kind of imitation. So this is, again, what many people regard as a hallmark of these kinds of systems. Um, so are people with autism impaired on imitation? And the, the answer seems to be yes and no. So they're more impaired on spontaneous. So they, they tend not to imitate in natural social settings. But if you ask them to imitate or instruct them to imitate, they seem to do so uh, behaviorally in a normal way. So the question there is what is the kind of primary deficit? So maybe it's that they don't understand the social significance of the imitation, that they haven't developed these kind of mechanisms for imitating, and that that's why they don't kind of engage in uh, spontaneous imitation in the same way, but they have the, the basic mechanisms in place to do that, if only they understand why th this happens, uh, and that we've all learned it kind of intuitively, that that's what we do and we like it, and, and so on. But, so, so again, you know, the people are, uh, use the imitation literature in both ways, because it is impaired, but the question is why is it impaired? And, so I think that this is a bit of a problem. Is that the, how is the broken mirror theory dealing with kind of classic tests such as false belief? Uh, you end up kind of going back to other things. It's a failure of kind of reasoning or executive functions and so on in addition to, to simulation and, and so on. That's the, the way kind of out of this uh, for them. Or you say there's a special theory of mind mechanism which... Uh, the, the people strongly advocated the broken mirror theory don't want to go down that line particularly. Um, this is kind of an interesting uh, middle mid, mid system in that we know that mirror systems and simulation in general is strongly modulated by top down control or beliefs. This is all the literature on empathy that I've shown you that whether or not you empathize or share experience depends on kind of beliefs and so on. So it might be that the mirror system is dysfunctional simply because you're not able to understand the social world, that you don't develop a functioning mirror system without being able to understand that. So here it could be, even if your uh, primary deficit is in theory of mind or something like theory of mind, it affects the mirror system because the mirror system is functions according to beliefs and uh, and other things that so you need this kind of, so it's a question of what's the core is the mirror system the core is it a consequence of another core deficit uh, that would be the thing but I, I think it has really kind of shaken things up a little bit because there are differences in mirror like things whether it's mu whether it's in uh, brain matter and so on there, there is something in there in imitation the question is is that the core thing or is that just a symptom of some other thing um, and for me, it probably is uh, you know, a symptom of other things. I think the other thing is whether or not um, is how mirror systems develop. So it seems to be the case that you're not born with them already in place. They kind of develop as a result of uh, motor learning. And if they d develop as a result of social interactions, if you, have, uh, if you don't have the normal set of social interactions, does that mean that your mirror system won't develop normally? So there's a very interesting developmental story about mirror systems that I think is kind of yet to be told that will probably uh, elucidate some of this. 
Um, any more comments? Yes. Okay. It seems like the, the, you know, the other thing that's seen in the is there's an over-sensory sort of uh, stimulisation. Yeah. Potentially, they are just finding that social interactions aren't pleasant because they're so messy and noisy and unsystematic. And so it's just they, they have, like you said, just a lot of yeah. all those social things that are allowing them to develop things like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's kind of the, uh, a bit of an angle of uh, Baron Cohen's systemising and so on. Is that is systemising a kind of a compensation strategy for not kind of engaging in the social world or not doing that? Or is yeah, but, but yeah, you're right. It's a question of uh, what, what is the kind of the essence here? What, what, what's on the periphery uh, with that? <coughs> so to to summarise. Um, in empathy, uh, I've kind of argued that simulation clearly has an important role, and you know th this is something that neuroscience can shed light on. But simulation can be overridden, for instance, by our beliefs, what our beliefs in whether a person is good or bad, an in-group or out-group, uh, whether an operation is going to be successful, you know, all these kinds of things. Seem to do that. So it's very context-sensitive, um, in a way that you might not expect from something where you know vision of action and kind of action themselves are, are, are so tightly coupled. Um, th this kind of notion of a simulation really does kind of link in a little bit of theory of mind and reasoning about mental states. So some people talk about affective empathy versus you know, cognitive-based aspects of empathy. De Setti's got his model in which simulation is part of it, but then you've got other mechanisms for kind of, kind of treating self and other as separate, which then feeds very much into the theory of mind uh, literature about other people have ideas which are different from you. Uh, so, so you've got this kind of nice connection between these two literatures. Um, so there's evidence that theory of mind does seem to engage a set of regions which aren't kind of exclusively language or executive functions and so on, but whether or not they are absolutely specific to certain uh, tasks is, uh, or certain kinds of ways of thinking is uh, questionable and uh, I, I'm not so convinced about that. Um, so the traditional explanation was mind blindness. So, uh, to some extent, you know, people with autism do fail these kind of classic tests. The, 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 the question is why? Do, can, should we automatically assume that there is a deficit in this kind of mechanism, or can other things come in? And also the wider profile of this. It's not just kind of false beliefs that people with autism are bad at. They're, they're bad at a range of different uh, kinds of behaviours in the social and the non-social uh, domains. Okay, so next week we've got the, the seminars. Before I finish, does anybody, it's your kind of 